exciting that the water fast is over. Amen. Yeah, I'm telling you, it throws off my whole week. Uh, and uh, no, it's just, it's great to, uh, to be celebrating that and to be a part of it. Uh, if we haven't met yet, my name's Michael and I'm one of the pastors here. Um, but uh, also, uh, before we go into our time of teaching, I've got an important announcement of my own. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but this Thursday is National Day of Prayer. And uh, I don't know about you, but if there's any year that we need prayer for our nation, it is now. And, uh, and so we're going to be doing a couple of events on that day. So we're going to have a sunrise service, and we're going to have a sunset service. Kind of reminds me of Fiddler on the Roof, but uh, anyway... <laughs> Uh, so anyway, so uh, what's gonna, we're going to be meeting out on the patio, unless I guess too many people show up, then we'd come in here, but we're going to meet out on the patio at 6 a.m. from 6 to 7 for some worship and prayers uh, for our nation, and then we're going to be meeting again from 7 to 8, and so we're going to watch the sun come up, we're going to watch the sun come down, and we're going to pray for our nation. Amen? Amen. So excited about that. Uh, anyway, we're going to go into our time of teaching, and uh, so if you haven't done so already, hopefully you pull, you pull out that um, message note sheet, or if you're online, you've got the uh, kind of drop down to, to print those off, and we're going to jump in. You guys ready to go? Let's do it. Okay, let's pray together. Father, we're just excited to be here as your people and your place underneath your leadership, and we're, uh, we're just asking for the work of your spirit all weekend long as we unpack your word together. Lord, as I was reflecting today on that, that beautiful passage, the kingdom of God does not consist in words, it's, it's in power. And so when we gather, Lord, it's not the words that are shared, it's the way you speak through the words that changes our lives. And so we pray for the, the work of your Holy Spirit. I pray for great freedom as I teach. I pray for us as a church, as we gather around your word, be hungry to listen and then follow. We pray this in your name. Everyone said, amen. amen. Well, our story starts today in the capital, and uh, once again, it's the holiday season, and so the place is packed. The city is packed, uh, and this morning, he actually lives here. He lives in the city. He's a, he's a native, and as he gets up this morning, he's going to slowly get dressed. It's always harder for him than for others, and uh, he has his breakfast, as always, and then he begins to slowly make his way through the crowded city streets into the place. And this place is very famous. In fact, not only are people from the city, but people from all over the country come here in the hopes of being healed. And that explains why when he arrives this morning, still fairly early, the place is packed with people coming in hopes of a healing. And at times, he'd be the first to admit that he wonders why he still comes. I mean, he's been coming hundreds and thousands of times. Why does he still come when he knows that chances are, due to his particular condition, the chances of being healed are almost nil? And yet he keeps making his way through the city streets day after day because he doesn't know what else to do. This is the only hope he has left. Well, today we're continuing this series that we've been in for the last couple months. It's called Signs of Path to Life. And for those of you who are new, a special welcome to you. Uh, this is a series about Jesus. It's an in-depth look at his life and teaching as seen and described through the eyes of one of his closest friends and followers, a man that we call John or the Apostle John, who towards the end of his life is writing his description, kind of a biography, a short biography of Jesus based on his firsthand experiences with Jesus over the period of about three years. 
And he's focusing in on his life, his teaching, but especially focusing in on seven supernatural signs, seven of the many Jesus performed, that help us understand who Jesus is and why he came and really mark the path to life for our lives. And so today we're going to continue by looking at the third of the seven signs. And so if you have your Bibles, you have your apps, let's go ahead and open up to John chapter 5. And while you're turning there, um, I want to set the stage. If you were here last week, we watched as Jesus performed his second sign in the north of the country, up in the area of the Galilee, when by just speaking a word, he healed a young boy who was sick uh, near, the, near the gates of death uh, with a fever. And uh, he speaks a word from 16 miles away, and he heals this, this boy. And today, we're going to watch as he goes south with his first few disciples, and they're going to go to the capital city, the spiritual capital of, the, of, of Israel, the city of Jerusalem. And it's during one of their national festivals or uh, kind of holidays. Uh, we're not sure which one. John normally tells us, but this is the one time he doesn't tell us. And while he's there, Jesus is going to have his first major run-in with the religious leaders of Israel, at least the first major run-in that's recorded in the Gospel of John. And the issue is going to be the Sabbath. And so what's going to happen is that, you know, for, for Jews, the Sabbath was a, uh, was a sacred day. It was a special day, a uh, special holiday that God had given his people when they came out of slavery in Egypt. Um, and, of course, they never had a day off there as slaves. He gave them this beautiful gift of a weekly holiday that every week they'd have a day off for rest, for reflection, for renewal, for healing, to get perspective on their lives. And so it was a tremendous gift, but over the years, uh, the religious leaders had added many man-made rules uh, to what God had said as they defined what it means not to work. And this had become, made the Sabbath as much of a burden as a gift. And there's a couple of those rules that are going to come into play in this account today. So I want to, I want to spell them out. Uh, one of the rules, and, and there were literally hundreds, over a thousand rules, um, that one of the rules is that it's not okay to practice medicine on the Sabbath. Like, don't, you can't schedule a doctor appointment for the Sabbath. Uh, if, in, if, if there's a life-threatening emergency, you can do enough uh, health, you know, health, kind of medicine to, to preserve life. But other than that, you're not supposed to practice medicine on the Sabbath. That would be work. Uh, another rule was that you are not to bear burdens on the Sabbath. Right? But the way they would define burdens was crazy. Like a woman wearing jewelry was a burden. For some of you guys, you say, yeah, that's a burden on me when my <laughs> wife wears jewelry. Uh, if you were a tailor and on the Sabbath you happened to go out with your cloak and you had a needle uh, that you'd put there to use during work, that would be bearing a burden because you're a tailor and you're carrying your work with you on the Sabbath. And so they made all these man-made rules. Uh, you know, Jesus would say later that that uh, uh, man was not made for the Sabbath, the Sabbath was made for man. It was just uh, this tremendous gift given you to take a day off, to rest, reflect. And they had, with all these man-made rules and definitions, turned it into a burden. And so those two rules are going to come to play today. All right, so if you have your Bibles, uh, let's turn to, open up to John chapter 5, and we will pick it up at verse 1. And so sometime later, so we're not sure how much later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, it's interesting. They always say they go up to Jerusalem, even if you're traveling from north to south like they are. And uh, there's a couple of reasons for this. One is that Jerusalem is at 2,500 feet uh, elevation, so you're normally traveling up. But the other reason, it's the spiritual high point of the nation, and so you always go up to Jerusalem. 
And so they went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Doesn't mention which one. Now, he's going to set the scene for us. He's assuming we've never been to Jerusalem. A lot of us have, but for his audience, he's assuming they, they haven't been there. So he's going to paint the picture. He says, now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic, which is the, 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 kind of the, the native language of most in Israel, uh, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda. And it's surrounded by five covered colonnades, okay? So let's talk about this. What's a colonnade? Uh, I need you to go back to school or your history classes. I want you to picture uh, Greco-Roman architecture. We'd have these huge stone pillars, right? And uh, so a colonnade would be these two rows of stone pillars with a huge stone roof resting on top of it. So it's like a, a very large, uh, impressive outdoor patio, right? And so there's this pool, and I want you to picture this. This pool is about 100 yards long. It's about the size of a football field. We've actually discovered the ruins. When we go to Israel, this is one of the places we go. Every year we go to the ruins at uh, the pools of Bethesda. And so uh, this, uh, this pool is about a, like a football field, about 100 yards long, and on every one of the, of the sides, you know, the four sides uh, is a colonnade, right, where, um, where people could come and get out of the, the heat. And right in the middle of the pool, at the halfway point, there's a, a colonnade that cuts across the middle, creating a north pool and a south pool. So it's a beautiful setting. Now, here's the thing. From time to time, and we don't know why, but from time to time, the water in the pool would bubble up. Uh, chances are these pools were fed by underground springs, and as you've, you've ever seen that, sometimes the water bubbles up. But because of this, a legend had grown up that when the water bubbled, what was actually happening was that angel was stirring the water. And that the first one in, after the water was stirred, would get healed. And so this place became very famous. The sick, the disabled would come in hopes that they would be the first to be healed. And so John says, here in verse 3, a number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. And there was one man here who had been there, was an invalid for 38 years. So out of all these, I want you to picture this, 100 yards long, all surrounded by colonnades, one in the middle, uh, beautiful architecture, uh, world famous place at that time. There was even uh, a temple to uh, like pagan god there uh, of healing uh, that, that people would come and they would lie there, uh, all these sick and disabled people in the hopes that they would be the first in. But what's gonna happen is John is gonna zoom in now on this one particular man who has been sick for 38 years. So he wasn't born this way, whatever his condition is. It says one who was there who had been an invalid. In the Greek, it says that he was weak. We don't really know. It sounds like he might have been lame, but we're not really sure. Uh, but uh, he's, been there, he's been in this condition for 38 years. Now this takes us back to the story we started the day with about this man who gets up early he gets dressed, but slower than most. It's not easy for him. And after he has some breakfast, he slowly makes his way through the crowded city streets to this place that's become so famous, knowing that the chances is he would ever be healed are very slim because of his condition. How is he going to make it first in the pool? How is he going to, how is he going to beat everyone there when it's so difficult for him to move. And so we're focusing in on zooming in on this one man. And all of a sudden we see Jesus coming along. So Jesus on this day is coming with some of his first disciples apparently. And he's walking through these colonnades full of sick, lame, paralyzed. And I want you to catch that he doesn't heal them all. He passes them all by, but he zooms in on this one man who's been there 38. This is his assignment. This is Jesus' assignment for the morning. And so he focuses in, and 
he says to this man, when Jesus saw him lying there, and this is a horrible translation, you'll rarely hear me say this, but it doesn't say learned, in the Greek it says he knew, okay? So when Jesus saw him lying there and he knew that he'd been in this condition for a long time, he says to him, do you wanna get well? This man doesn't need know Jesus from anyone else. You're laying there, you're in the shade, you're surrounded by sick people and a stranger comes up and says, hey, you wanna get well? And he's like, yeah. And so the way he said it is, um, well, sir, I have no one to help me get in the pool when the water is stirred. And while I'm trying to get in, someone else gets down ahead of me. So in other words, yes, I, I'd like to, but I'm not sure how this will ever happen. And so Jesus just looks at him and he says, okay, well, great, that's what I need to know. Uh, why don't you just get up and pick up your mat and walk? And in that moment, this man who's been sick or lame or crippled, whatever his condition is, for 38 years in that moment, he is instantly healed. But not only is he instantly healed, his strength returns. I, I don't know if you've ever broken anything. I've broken a few things, <laughs> as you know, including my head a couple times. But it keeps healing. But if you've broken an arm, you've broken a leg, you've broken a finger, you've had shoulder surgery like in your right shoulder, um, like you almost torn your finger off, like if you, if you have, um, and all the bones come out, if you've had, if, if you've ever had that and you've had a cast on, you know that even after six weeks, your, your body has shrunk up, it's not working. Can you imagine being an invalid for 38 years? And Jesus just says, all he says is get up and pick up your mat. And this guy just gets up and he picks up his mat. Now, John being the master storyteller, he says, oh, by the way. He said the day on which this took place was the Sabbath. And that's where this story is going. So the Jewish leader said to the man who had been healed, now apparently they weren't there. I mean, we, we have no evidence that they were there and saw this. So it's the Sabbath, everyone's chilling, and along comes a guy, we're carrying his mat. Now you're not supposed to be carrying a needle in your coat. A guy's carrying a mat. And he's like, he sticks out like a sore thumb. And so the religious police come out and they're gonna call him like, what in the world do you think you're doing violating the Holy Sabbath by carrying a mat? And so in verse 10, the Jewish leader said to the man who'd been healed, it's the Sabbath, the law forbids you from carrying your mat. Now it doesn't really, it says you should not work. They've defined it as carrying a mat. But he replied, well, listen, the man who made me well, he told me to pick up your mat and walk. Subtext, hey, when you have been sick for 38 years and someone heals you supernaturally and tells you to pick up your mat and walk, you pick up your mat and walk. <laughs> and so they asked him, well, who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? And he doesn't know. Remember the scene? He's just lying there. Some guy comes up, doesn't know. Hey. Do you want to get well? Yeah, I can't though. Yeah, well, we'll just get up. He never asked him his name. And after, he, after Jesus performs his third sign, um, I'm sure the place is going crazy and Jesus quietly slips away. And so he goes, I don't know. I didn't get, he didn't leave his card. I don't know. <laughs> I love this. The man who was healed had no idea who it was. For Jesus slipped away in the crowd. By the way, Jesus is really good at this slipping away thing. <laughs> We're going to see it throughout the Gospel of John. He keeps slipping away. Uh, so later, and we don't know how much later, uh, my guess it's the same day, but it doesn't really say, but later Jesus finds him at the temple. Now, for those of you who have been with us in Israel, you might be able to picture this. When you're at the pools of Bethesda, you're very close to Temple Mount. And uh, 
it would make sense to me that if God's healed you after 38 years, you're probably going to the temple to give thanks, maybe to give a thank offering, something like that. But, but whatever the case, uh, what's really interesting is that Jesus hunts him down to do a little post-healing counseling. <laughs> and so what he says to him is fascinating. He's, he finds him at the temple. Remember, this is the festival time. You can have as many as 100,000 people in the temple courts. It's no easy job. He finds him and he says, see, you're well again. Now he tells him something really interesting. He says, stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. Whoa. I think if I'm the guy, he's got my attention. And what's really interesting is we know that in the Bible, this is not the norm. Like in the Bible, in the teaching of Jesus, in fact, we'll see this in John chapter 9, that normally physical illness, sickness, tragedy is not the result of our individual sin. It's only, but there are times when it is, when because of our sin, there's a judgment of God. And apparently, this is the time. So we, we don't know this man's story or what he was doing, or what he had done. But Jesus says, hey, you need to knock it off. Otherwise, something really bad's gonna happen to you. And we don't know if he was saying, hey, you're gonna get really, that your sickness is coming back and it's gonna get worse. Or was he even looking eternally and saying, you need to get right with God. Because if you think this is bad, like, it'll be way worse in eternity. We're not really sure. But either way, the man now knows who Jesus is. And so he goes, for whatever reason, he tells the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. And so because Jesus was doing these things, notice plural, these things, uh, John's highlighting this sign, but apparently there's others that have been going on on Sabbath. So because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. And so so catch this, this, this man who's been sick for 38 years comes up. He says, hey, the guy who healed me, can you catch us? They don't care he's healed. They're missing the sign. Yeah. I mean, all they care about is, hey, he's breaking the rules about the Sabbath. And he's got to be like a false prophet. And so the sign that's supposed to be pointing to who Jesus is, is going right over their head. All they care about are their religious rules. And so... This man comes to them and says, hey, the guy, remember you were asking me about the guy. I got his name now. Here's his card. His name's Jesus. He's from Nazareth. And so they're going to now chase down Jesus. And when they get there, this is how the conversation is going to go. So because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, they began to persecute him. So in his defense, Jesus said, yeah, my dad... It's interesting because in Jewish culture, you would talk about our father, but not my father. This is kind of like saying, like, my dad. My father, he's always at work to this very day, and I, too, am working. So the question is, what are you doing healing on the Sabbath? And the answer is, you know, my dad's always working. And um, I'm just kind of following his example and doing what he's showing me to do. Now, the first part of this statement that my father is working, the rabbis would have, for the most part, agreed with that. Most rabbis believe that because God has to continue running the universe on the Sabbath, he's working. He's get, he gets an exemption from his own law. He's above his own law. But what Jesus' claim is that God is his personal father and that his dad is working on the Sabbath and so he's just doing what his dad's doing. Uh, He's above the law, making himself equal with God, who it's okay to work on the Sabbath. And so this is not gonna go well. And so in verse 18, for this reason, John explains they tried all the more to kill him because they they would have seen this and we'll see this as as the gospel of John unfolds. They'll see this 
these many claims Jesus is making is blasphemous. And the, the sin of blasphemy in the law of Moses called for stoning. And we'll see it many times. We'll see it three times specifically. This time they don't mention stoning. The next two they will in chapter 8 and chapter 10. But here they said that uh, because he was making himself equal with God, uh, that they were wanted to, that, to kill him. Okay? And so Jesus is going to say, Yes, just in case you didn't understand what I'm claiming, let me explain. So Jesus gave this answer very truly. And remember, in the Gospel of John, we see the words, words very truly. Those are the Greek two words, amen, amen. Uh, it's Jesus' way of saying truly, truly. Uh, put neon lights around this, really important. Don't miss this. He says, amen, amen, I tell you, the son can do nothing of himself. Like you think that I'm doing this healing on the Sabbath uh, on my own, but that's not, that's not the truth. I, I don't do anything on my own. Um, he can only do what he sees his father doing. It's almost the picture here of like a, a son growing up in the shop of his father, apprenticing, and as the father shows you how to do things that, then the son can begin to imitate that. And he says, he can only do what he sees the father doing because whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son like a good father would love his son and teach him more and more of the family business. He says that the father loves his son and he shows him all he does. And he says, yes, and he will show him even greater works than these so that you will be amazed. In other words, you ain't seen nothing yet. There's more to come. And next week, he'll give them a hint of where this story is going, but for today, we're gonna stop it here. And I wanna focus on this statement that Jesus makes that the son can do nothing by himself. He only does what he sees the father doing. Uh, because it's a powerful statement about who Jesus is, how he approached life, but it's a po powerful model for us of what it means to be a follower of Jesus as well. And so what I wanna do is I wanna highlight just one big picture principle that flows out of this passage and then come back and ask two specific questions that help us do some evaluation for our own life. So there in your notes, you have a section called Signs the Model. And so here's the principle that Jesus models a life of listening and following. Jesus models a life of listening and following. Now, here at Rocky Peak, we use this term a lot. We talk about listening and following a lot. And it's just sort of a sort of a, a, a motto that's just kind of organically grown in our church over the years. And you can see this principle being lived out throughout Scripture, but I think you see it most clearly in the life of Jesus. And so you say, well, what, what does it mean to listen and follow? Well, what we mean by that, and we say that here is that we believe as followers of Jesus, we come to Jesus, we receive the gift of his Holy Spirit, who comes to lead us and to guide us by his word, by the Spirit, by wise counsel, and a host of other ways that the Holy Spirit uses to show us the next step in our life. And that, that the key to our growth, the key to our transformation, the key to the impact we have in our life, the key to the difference we make for eternity, um, and uh, the level that we experience this life Jesus has come to give us is directly proportionate to the extent that we've learned to listen and follow. And that when we listen and follow the next step, that he shows us the next one. Very much like Jesus said here, the Father shows me the next thing, I'll be doing more things. And so what we see is that Jesus models this life of listening and following, and we're gonna see it all through the Gospel of John. In fact, it's one of the reasons why the Gospel of John's my favorite Gospel, because it gives us a window into Jesus' entire approach to life, which helps us understand what our approach to life is supposed to be. 
So we see it here in John chapter 5. And I want you to look again at this statement again. He says in John uh, chapter 5, Very truly, amen, amen, I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. So I want you to think about that. If there's anyone that should be able to come up with a vision for his life, (laughs) it would be the Son of God. And yet when Jesus came... He didn't set his own agenda. He came to carry out the vision, the values, the assignment that the Father had given. We're going to see it all through the Gospel of John. He says, the son, you you look at me here, you see me healing people on the Sabbath, you think that was my idea? Do you think I just went off the reservation? And I just decided that I was going to start healing people on the Sabbath. You don't understand. The son does nothing by himself. Here's what the son does is he hangs on every word of the father. What he does is he he watches his father work. What he does, he listens for the father's voice. Just like on this day, he walked by all those other sick people and made a beeline for this man because this was his assignment on that day. The son does nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees the father doing because whatever the father does, the son does also. For the son loves the son and shows him all he does. We saw something very similar in John chapter 4. I don't know if you remember this, but remember when Jesus was talking to the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the city of Sychar. Remember he shows up, he sends his disciples into town to get some food, to get some lunch. While they're gone, he has this amazing conversation with this uh, woman of Samaria. He's been married five times, living with a man. This is incredible. And he offers her this gift of living water that will become a well springing up to eternal life. And so when, when his men get back and they've got the food, they've got the fast food, they have takeout. Uh, <laughs> when they get back, um, they said, hey, we got the food. And he says to them, I have food you guys haven't learned about yet. And they're like, Hey, do you think someone brought him some stuff? What's he talking about? We can never understand what he means. He's always saying these weird things. And, uh, and then Jesus says this. He says, my food, that, is that which energizes me, that which sustains me, that which gives me life, empowers me, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. That's my passion. That's what fills me. And so what we're going to see as we go through the Gospel of John, we're going to see a couple things about Jesus. Number one, his top priority in life, his top passion in life, bar none, was to know, to love, and to please his Father as his top priority. And catch this, and the way he did that was by listening and following. And what I want you to catch is that what Jesus is doing is not just for his life. He's modeling for us the path to life. Because if we want to experience this life that Jesus has come to give us, the key is that we learn to listen and follow our Father as he did. Because at the heart of this new life, at the heart, when you break it down, at the very heart of this new life is this passion for God above all other passions. And this approach to life where because of that, we hang on our Father's words and we listen and follow. So this leads into a couple questions. I'm going to show a couple questions. So the first question is this. And this is a question just for you to mull on, right? It's not a question for your neighbor. Um, It's not a question you have to get right. 
it's a question I want you to explore and to think about. We've seen what, here's what Jesus' passion is. Tell you, the, your, the question is, what is your top passion? In your life, what, what's the top, what's, what drives you in your life? Because what we're going to see in the Gospel of John is that this is why Jesus has come. And this is at the heart of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And this is at the very core of what this new life, this eternal life that Jesus has come to give us. He's come to introduce us to our creator and such a way that when that happens, that, ca- that he captures our imagination and he becomes the passion that rules all other passions in our life. In John 17, at the very end of this gospel, right before Jesus is arrested, he's praying to his father, and this is what he says. He says, now this is eternal life. I don't want to stop right there. Cover up the verse, don't keep reading. (laughs) This is eternal life. He says, let me... Let me define for you, what is eternal, boil it down, what is eternal life? And I think for many of us, you say, well, what is eternal life? It's it's life after death. It's living forever. It's going to heaven when you die. That's us, we think in those terms. But I keep on telling you that in the gospel of John, eternal life is not just about length of life. It's about a quality of life, a whole new type of life. And yes, it goes on forever, but it's more than just length of life. And look what he says. Now, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. He said, at the heart of this new life, at the heart of the living water, at the heart of the bread of life, at the heart of the light of life, at the heart of this, is a relationship with our creator that we are designed for. And so he came, and Jesus has come not just to forgive us, but to transform us and and teach us how to enter into this new life, this life that we were designed for. And what I want you to catch is we cannot experience the fullness of life until our passion for God exceeds all other passions. And to the extent our passion for God grows, our experience of the life he came to give us increases. Amen? Amen. And number two, the second question. The second question is, to whom are you listening and following? To whom are you listening and following? What we've seen today, and we're just at the beginning of this journey in John, we'll see this over and over again. We'll come back to it later in a couple months. But what we're seeing is that for Jesus, his top priority in life was to please his father, to to know him, to love him, to please him. But what's interesting, uh, so for Jesus, his top priority is then, then How do you do that? How do you know? How do you please? How do you love your father? Well, you listen and follow. You watch and do. You follow his example. You know, you, the different metaphors. But what's interesting is when we get to John chapter 10, remember that famous verse in John chapter 10, I've come that you might have life and have it to the full. But in that context, Jesus says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. So the question is, Jesus says that the path to this life to the full is learning to listen for the voice of our shepherd and then following, right? We listen and we follow. So the question is, who is the loudest voice in your head? We talk about someone who marches to the beat of a different drummer. As Christians, that drummer is Jesus. So the question is, 
Who is the loudest voice in your head? Which voice are you listening and following? There's many competitive voices in our life for who we listen and follow other than the voice of the shepherd. The number one competitor is our own voice, isn't it? Kind of what we think is the best idea. Like what we think makes sense. What, thinks, what we think will give us life. What we think will lead life to the fall. That's our biggest competitor is our own voice. But hey, there's other voices that compete, aren't there? There's the voice of the enemy. There is the voice of our culture. Now, right now, our culture is screaming at us in this crazy country we live in. It is screaming at us. We're going to change what's good will be bad, what's bad will be good. We're going to change our entire view of sexuality. We're going to change our entire view of relationships. Our culture is screaming at us. Do you feel the pressure? Do you feel the pressure? It's like, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you every minute, culture. You are coming at me 24-7. And as the culture screams at you, who's the loudest voice in your head? The voice of your shepherd or the voice of the culture? What about the voice of family, of friends, of colleagues? Who's the loudest? Whose voice are you listening and following? You know, for Jesus, one of the things I love about Jesus is he just doesn't give a rip about anyone else. <laughs> I, I just, I'm from the time, I was young, he's just like he captivates me. It's like he's got the whole world against him. And he just keeps marching away to the beat of a different drummer. Like you see it in this account. Like we look back, I mean, these are the religious leaders. These would be like all the pastors of the day. And they're all in agreement that you cannot work on the Sabbath. And what that means is things like this. You know, in the year 200, the descendants of the Pharisees created, they wrote down their rules in a book we call the Mishnah. Maybe you've heard about it. And though it's 170 years after the time of Jesus, many scholars feel like these are oral traditions that have come down for a long time. This is a pretty good window into what life will be like at the time of Jesus. You know, when it comes to the Sabbath, they had 39 categories of what constituted work. And every category had 20, 30, 40 definitions. This was, this was the culture he'd grown up in. And yet Jesus, Jesus heals on the Sabbath. He could have just avoided the conflict by waiting one day. He could have just said, you know what? This is going to lead to my death. They're going to kill me over this. And so I'll just heal Monday through Saturday. I mean, six out of seven, not bad. But Jesus didn't care what the religious leaders thought. He lived his life for the audience of one. And guess what? When his disciples tried to deter his course, he said, get behind me, Satan. And when his mothers and brothers came to get him because they thought he'd gone crazy, he said, forget them. Who's my mother, brother, and sisters? Those who do the will of God. It's my mother, brother, and sister. Jesus lived his life for an audience of one. And catch us, the more we live our life for the audience of one, the more life we have. And he has come to set us free from these other voices inside our head. 
that would lie, distract, get us off track. And so the question is, what is, who is your greatest, what or who is your greatest passion? And then to whom are you listening and following? Because Jesus has come to show us the path to life. And it's only as our passion for God increases and becomes greater than every other passion. And because of that, we laser lock in and listen and focus. It's there we will grow. It's there we will be transformed. It's there that we will have impact. And it's there we will discover the life he came to give us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Jesus, I am just so thankful for you for so many reasons. I think of your death for, for me, for us, that gives us life. But I all thank, thank for your life, the life that you lived that showed us the path to life. And so, Father, we pray that this will be a time for us to really do some soul searching and to ask the question, what is my greatest passion? And Lord, I know it's impossible for us to create passion for you on our own. That's a work of the Holy Spirit. But I know it begins by us inviting you in and saying, Lord, if you can create a passion in me for you that's greater than all other passions, I give you permission to change my heart. Father, thank you for the way your son modeled for us this living for an audience of one such a beautiful thing and we pray that you would free us from these other voices, a fear of other voices that, that we would learn to listen and follow like a, a father to a son as you show us the path to life we would just listen and follow and that therein we would find the life you've come to give us so God we pray that you would just purify our hearts, you refine us we give ourselves to you now in Jesus name Amen.